welcome to On The Move, where we keep you informed and inspired. Today, we're going to be talking about making an impact in the political arena and women in politics, specifically women of color in uh, politics. And a very special guest that we have coming up today, uh, we can't talk about that without talking about her. Um, of course, you know, we had black people in this country, um, Andrea, for however long, since the 1600s. And it's just unbelievable to think that up until 1900, we didn't have the first, uh, that's when we had the first black woman. Um, of course, we had Lincoln Alexander and stuff like that before, um, but we had the first black woman. Took so many years, so, so, so many years. But um, before now, um, the conventional political wisdom, I guess, that we could say would be that women are less interested and less engaged in politics, which I don't think was necessarily the case, but it didn't really have a space for them. Andrea, do you think that would be, I guess, correct to say? I women probably would want to, but I don't think it was accepting. Exactly. They didn't have the opportunity. And what's so amazing that today the doors have been flown open, that now we have a plethora of women that are in politics, women that are running. And I know, Kim, let's talk about the fact that one day we know yes. we'll be running and actually <laughs> getting out there and um, grabbing that baton from the leaders that have gone on before us and have paved the way. And we're excited to get into this conversation yeah. today and talk about our, our, the ladies, the ones that have went before us and yes. um, to pave the way. To pave the way. Yeah. And that is, that is so, so important for those who have that opportunity. And yes, you know, as a community and political um, advocate, I do intend on one day running because there's no greater way to affect change, right? But exactly. of course, that opportunity, um, even me thinking about that, it's made possible because of those who've gone ahead. Um, so you don't want to go anywhere. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Where we're going to get to introduce our guests. And of course, by my introduction, you can actually almost imagine, but you got to stay with us to see who it is. We'll be right back after this break. Yes. This is On The Move. Hello and welcome back to On The Move, where we keep you informed and inspired. Today we are talking about making an impact in the political arena and women in politics, uh, specifically women of color. And that conversation can't be had without this uh, fine lady that we have here today, a trailblazer, an activist, a uh, former MP, Speaker of the House. Uh, I mean, the list just goes on and on. We are talking about the phenomenal Honorable Dr. Jean Augustine, thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Augustine. Well, thank you, Kimberly, and thank you all those who are involved in this endeavor. I think blessings in these challenging times. Amazing, amazing. Okay. So um, I'm going to get right into it. Yes. I would consider you one of the, the heavyweights, right, in the political arena, a pioneer for sure, specifically for women of color um, in politics, right? I'm going to yes. take it back to 1993, oh, right? Yes. 1993, you made history by becoming the first African Canadian woman to be uh, an MP, right? When the election was going and the ballot was called and it was officially declared, talk to us about that moment. Well, I think it's important uh, to note that I was the first African Canadian woman or black woman to black, be... Yeah to be elected to the Parliament of Canada, elected in an area where we don't have residential pattern that says this is a black area, this is an area where um, the majority of black people in Toronto live. So I had to, <laughs> I had to be uh, the candidate for all of the people, the Ukrainians, the Poles, the Estonians, the, all the European groups who live in Etobicoke Lakeshore. Uh, at the same time, I think it's important for me to state that there were two men who were uh, in the Parliament of Canada prior to my coming to the Parliament in 93. We had Lincoln Alexander, who was first yes. there, That's and uh, we had Dr. Howard McCurdy from Windsor. Um, Lincoln was um, PC, Progressive Conservative, and um, Dr. Howard McCurdy was New Democratic Party. Both men were long gone from the House of Commons by 1993. Mm -hmm. It's also important for me to say, Kimberly, that Black people have been in this country 
since 1603, 1604. We know that, and there is documented evidence for that. And to think that from the 1600s, yeah. not until the 1900s, 1993, that the first woman would enter the Parliament of Canada. Yeah. In 1993, when at uh, the end of 92, 93, running the campaign, knocking at doors, thousands and thousands of doors, um, ensuring that I spoke to hundreds and hundreds of people, that I looked for the support for funds, because it's important when you're running that you have the necessary dollars. It's also mm -hmm. important when you're running that you have the support, people who would walk yes. with you, who would knock at the doors with you. And uh, so the night um, when the votes are being counted, uh, they distract you during the day, you mm -hmm. go out encouraging people to go to the polls, according yes. to our law, go TV. you can't tell yeah. people who to vote for in that day, but you could encourage people to go to the polls and vote. And then I had friends who distracted me by taking me to a restaurant for a nice dinner. And the, the nice dinner could be, if you lose, you have something in your stomach, if you win. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and also the, um, the campaign folks preparing two speeches for you. One, yes. if you win, and, and if one, you if you lose. And so you have those two um, speeches in your pocket. Mm -hmm. um, the votes are counted. We, while we were having dinner, we were watching the television and my numbers, I was winning poll after poll after poll. Amazing. And so I knew that we had had it. So by the time I, it was called and uh, the television stations had put their check mark off and announced that I was now the member, I was now the winner in Etobicoke Lakeshore. By the time I got to the, um, to the celebration, um, I knew that I was the winner and I knew so you know what speech you were going to sing. <laughs> <laughs> I know what I was going to pull out from my pocket, but not very good at reading speeches. I ad lib because I got into, uh, into the hall where we did, the, uh, where we had a party planned and just, uh, the energy of the folks and the joy and the celebratory, um, mood of the place. I got into that mood and um, and just thanked everybody. Floods. Thanked yeah. everybody who were engaged, who were involved, who helped, who donated. And, uh, and uh, we had a really, really great event. The media were all there. And of course, you know, the, the provocative way in which sometimes the media operates one person said to me, how do you feel as a black woman um, being elected? And of course, my response at the time was, I didn't run as a black woman because when I knocked at the doors, I didn't say, hey, vote for me, I'm a black woman. I said, vote for me because this is what I thought about Canada. This is where I think right. Canada should go. This is what the Liberal Party at the time was running on under the liberal banner. These are some of the, the, um, the, the projects and, 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 uh, and policies and things that they will implement. And so we had a really, really great celebration way into the night um, Excellent. as I became the first African-Canadian woman to be elected to the Parliament of Canada. So that was that election night and that, that was awesome. election. That is so great. Awesome. It's such an honor to even sit and speak with you. And let's talk about legislations. Now, I know you served in office for four, for about four terms, terms right? And also you um, were very instrumental in passing some legislations, especially when it came to Black history. Can you tell us about um, that? Well, I think it's important that when you get to the Parliament of Canada, there's just so much the place, there is a sense of awe, this mm -hmm. historic building. At the same time, you walk around and you see a lot of images on, on the wall of, uh, of Black men who've served in the Parliament of Canada. There was only one woman who was mm -hmm. ever the Prime Minister of Canada for a very short space of time, Kim Campbell. 
And mm -hmm. at the same time, you see all of these male images everywhere. And you see, and as you look up at the ceiling and you see the architecture, the design, it was a place built by men to do men's work. And it's that sense of awe, the chamber itself, the green um, chairs, because it's supposed to be representative of the people. Whereas mm -hmm. the Senate, on the other hand, the red chairs, um, representative mm -hmm. of uh, royalty, the queen, etc., mm -hmm. and the constitution. So I walk in there, and of course, I didn't go to the Parliament of Canada. Neither did I arrive at that stage in my life where I was tabula rasa, right? A clean slate. I went in there with vast amount of experience. I, I had come through the ranks of education all the way to supervisory officer, principal vice principal supervisory officer. I had come through uh, the head of um, Metro Toronto Housing Authority. I had been sitting on various boards. I had, I had something behind me. I can, there were many boxes that I can say, check, check, did this, did that. But I had some fire in my belly. And to get into politics, you have to have some fire in the belly. You have to have something that you want to accomplish. It's not just, I want to go there and be pretty. I want to go there and be in the, the place where decisions are made. I want to go there because I want to have to see some things accomplished. I had had the experience of seeing people caught in socioeconomic difficult situation in Metro Toronto housing. And I know that the only answer and solution was really in the political arena. I watch people, the police and, and, uh, and the community and all of those, those necessary things that had to happen. And know it was all through legislation, through those things that you can make things happen. And so I went you know, with determination that there were some things I was going to do to make sure. And so I voted on all kinds of issues that had to do with uh, social security reforms, supporting um, women, looking at a whole, and you know, I can go through a whole series of things, but that I supported. I was part of discussions around population and development, reproductive health, all the issues, the justice issues, the issues around um, equality, diversity and inclusion. We didn't use those words now, but we talked a bit about, you know, prejudice and discrimination and systemic racism. Mm -hmm. And I worked on all of this. I was chair of women's caucus uh, in the Parliament of Canada. And for the very first time in the Parliament of Canada, they had a critical mass or more, or not a critical mass, but they had the greatest number of women in the Parliament of Canada at the time. And so to move and to say, what have I got in my belly that I can accomplish and make a difference um, towards? And I start working on those things where I thought I can make a difference. And I start looking for other members of parliament who felt like I did, because in the Parliament of Canada, and I'm sure you know this, uh, Kim, in the Parliament of Canada, to do anything, you have to have a seconder. You have to yes. have supporters. And right now we keep talking about allies. We didn't use the term allies, but really you had to have allies. You have to have people who would support you. And I felt very passionate about the fact that when I was an educator, I was making up modules to teach my, um, my students about the, the, the black presence in the Canadian mosaic, as I used to call it, to talk about indigenous people, to talk about so many things that were not modules in our social studies um, uh, teaching, that mm -hmm. um, there were, who were all of these black people that I was hanging out with, coming from Nova Scotia, coming from different parts of Africa, coming from wherever, when I went out west, I was president of the Congress of Black Women of Canada or went yes. around the country in that regard. And I saw black women all over them and hear about their history, where they came from, where their parents came from, how they arrived, you know, all the way from Oklahoma, all the way from wherever to, to add and to contribute to Canada. And so yes. when the Ontario Black History Society 
um, asked the government of Canada to do a proclamation about black history because in the United States, as you know, Carter G. Woodson, who started uh, Black History Month in the United States, um, Stan Grizel and a number of the, the people who worked on the railroad were, uh, were bringing back information about what was going on in the US. And the Canadian Association of Negro Women were pick, mm -hmm. you know, had picked up the story. And, and in Toronto, very, very early, we started talking about Black history. But it was just something you did because you copied the US. And right. so when mm -hmm. they asked uh, the parliament, uh, they asked the minister responsible to do a proclamation, the minister said no. And then the minister told me, well, you know, there is a group in Toronto who were asking for Black History Month. I said, yes, because we don't da 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 da. And I started down the road and he said, well, I'm sorry, but I have to say no to them because no. the government of Canada does not do proclamations. So I said, I started to ask, what can I do to make this happen? And I was told, you have two avenues open to you, Mrs. Augustine. You can either do a private member's bill, which is you have to get it all scripted, all this, all legal, look for precedents, da, 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 and then you put it in the hat because private member's bill are selected out of uh, almost like a lottery. Right. And, and um, so that was one avenue. And knowing my luck, because I had been buying um, lottery tickets and I, I was <laughs> there, and I go to, to, to functions and I buy the ticket and I'm never one who win. And I thought the chance of my putting in my private member's bill after months of work, it may not be selected. So I, I asked, is there another way? And the other way was, would you do a motion and the motion called for unanimous consent. Wow. That is good. each person. And in, in, uh, at that time, 1995, there were 305 members in the house. So each person had to know what my motion was going to be. Each person had to make a decision as to whether they would support it. And um, I didn't know what date or what time the, um, that my motion would come up in the in the order of business and so i had to speak to everybody had to speak to everybody and uh in the end um when after i'd written up the motion and um and i brought it to the house leader he said to me what do you want here do you want a debate that would go on for months <laughs> and then I was advised that if you want a motion and you want unanimous consent, the motion has to be precise. It has to be clear and it has to go directly to the point that you want to make with nothing debatable in this. And so when you mm -hmm. see the motion that I passed, you'll see that uh, it says that we were here since uh, 1603, that we've been making our contribution to Canada, right. that we are a diverse right. black community in Canada. Yes. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I call, so it, there was nothing that was debatable in what I put forward. And All I fact, call on the house yes. to give unanimous, um, to give me unanimous support. And so when mm -hmm. the speaker rose to ask the question, does, they don't call you by name in the house, you know that. Uh, does the, I was parliamentary Honor, secretary. member of parliament, yeah. Uh, no, they call you by your, um, your riding or they call you by your position. I was parliamentary secretary at the time. So the speaker says, does the parliamentary secretary have the consent of the house for this motion? And of course, when you get the I and the yes and the, and the decor, then you realize that that yeah. motion is now passed by the parliament of Canada. And that was December 1995. Amazing. Amazing. But if you, so see, if you see what's happening now, you know what's happening. Exactly. Whether it's in churches, in synagogues, in entertainment areas, in schools, in colleges, in corporate body, everyone now is celebrating right. Black History Month in Canada. And uh, also, I just want to make this note February 20, 
2021 will be 25 years since that motion was passed. Excellent. Absolutely amazing. We're going to take a commercial break and we'll be right back after this message. On the move. We'll be right back. Welcome back to On The Move. We are in conversation with the Honorable Dr. Jean Augustine. So of course, uh, before the break, we finished talking about that monumental motion and how we can credit Black History Month to Dr. Augustine, which is amazing. Um, Dr. Augustine, I know that you uh, donate much of your like archival and par um, parliamentary materials to York University, right? Um, in support of education since like back in 08. Um, it initially, it was uh, called the Jean Augustine Chair in Education in Urban Environment, and later now just the Jean Augustine Chair in Education. And I know you're working closely with that because even with the social media I'm, I'm following. So what was the motivation behind donating the materials initially? And talk to us about the chair. Well, if, um, if you recollect my discussion with you about getting to the Parliament of Canada and having some notions the, as I said, <laughs> the fire in your belly around the certain, you know, certain things you want to see accomplished. And uh, as I looked around, I looked for the gaps that there were uh, in the, um, in research, in policies, in programs, and in government things that either did not include or excluded in some way um, people of African descent. And um, I had an ally, and I'm using the word ally now because in those days I, we didn't use the word ally. But I had an ally in Sheila Copps, who was a deputy prime minister and was also the minister of Canadian heritage. And she threw um, two responsibilities from heritage to me. One was archives and museum, and the other was chairs in universities and colleges. So I called a meeting of archives and, um, and museums, um, starting with black community. And I saw the paucity, that is the lack of really great museums and archives that we can say are black museums or black archives. The numbers to, who came to the meeting were small family oriented, um, archives or museums, uh, many of them were just community and many of them lacked the resources to really set up in a real archival fashion. So I thought we had to do something about that. And we had to look at programs and we had to look at what assistance could be given by the federal government to make sure that we fill that gap for the the black community in Canada. The other was chairs. And when we called the meeting of chairs from across the country, we we'll think about 90 something universities and colleges and whatnot. I found that there was nothing and no one around the table that can speak to a fully funded chair at the university. When I say no one, I mean in terms of the black community or the Caribbean community right. or the African community. Mm -hmm. And so I started looking into why this was not so. Why we seem to be every place, but we're not in that institutional academic setting. And what I found out and which is important to say is that the chair in a university at the time is $3 million. The university does not give a chair. Mm -hmm. Someone comes from the outside with the resources and they endow, they give $3 million, which is endowed at the university to give a chair in health studies or a research chair in whatever it is. And their name goes onto the chair. Well, we did not have a chair because we didn't have the resource. There was a James Johnson chair at Dalhousie University, but it was not fully funded. Um, and um, so the endowment is not such that it would keep going in perpetuity. What the 3 million does, it goes to 
that endowment at the university. And it's working in perpetuity. As long as the university is standing, the chair will be standing if it's funded with the 3 million. The 3 million is endowed and the interest from the 3 million is what comes out to fund the, uh, the professor who is a holder of the chair and also the work of the chair. Right. And uh, I started asking around why is why why some over the other, but I knew because I had been on the venture early on with people like the Bev Maskell and several others who've passed on to get that Del James Johnson chair at uh, in Dalhousie University uh, funded because the um, the Progressive Conservative government Jerry Weiner urged on by John Dennison, who was working for him at the time, um, had started us with 400 and something million dollars to get the chair started, a million, 400 and something thousand dollars oh, to get the chair yeah. started. <laughs> <laughs> so we could begin to have, a, to have a foundation and we could build on that 400 and something million, um, thousand. What am I getting my numbers? Um, you want that, that amount of money for sure, <laughs> right? To get it fully endowed. Right. So, so. We, need, we need 3 million to endow a chair so we can have a chair. So when I left um, the, the Parliament of Canada, and this happens to any member, they can tell you this, they come and they pack up for you. They make sure all the documents, especially my ha having been a minister that nothing that was confidential and government was taken out and taken away. And uh, they help you to wrap your photographs and pictures and, uh, and all your material. And in those days you use tape a lot and you tape speeches and all of that stuff. So I ended up with 450 boxes um, of my archival and other material. Um, and artifacts and other things from the House of Commons. The Archives of Canada had sent me a letter asking that my stuff remain in the archives in Ottawa. I wanted my things to come to Toronto where your sons and daughters and my grandchildren and yes. everyone can see and read and listen to some of the stuff. Mm -hmm. So I said, no, 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 I wanted it to come to Toronto. So we brought it to Toronto and I had it in storage. And then I decided to pally that archival material into a chair. And so after much discussion with Ryerson and University of Toronto, which is my alma mater, um, I ended it with York and um, had an agreement with York that they will archive all of my material and it's all archived there now for anyone to, to go and it's being used, I understand, quite a good deal. And in return, York would put about a million on the table and matched with two million that I at the time said I was going to go out into the black community and raise two million. By us, for us, for us. with us, <laughs> so that right. we can have this chair and the grandmother can say, I have $25 in this chair. And then someone can say, I did make a, a donation to this chair. And that our students walking through the university will have something to be proud of. When they see other chairs, they can see that one that they could associate with. So we had a disagreement that we would set up the chair, $3 million, York will match, one million and I will go out there and raise two million. That is amazing. I, well, so, so. I, I did everything <laughs> I possibly can. And and I, I, I hit everybody that I could, uh, right, everybody. Right. I even sent um, letters to the churches, including your church. I sent packages to your minister, to all of them. I said, even if you take $15 or $10 from each, <laughs> For each, right. <laughs> or each church goer, um, we can we can do that two million. Actually, I was idealistic. I really thought we could have raised two million, 
and I'm now throwing the baton to all you young people and all those people who understand that it's one thing to give scholarships and to give whatever, but if the young people with the scholar walking through the, the halls of the university with the scholarships and they don't have that self-esteem, that boost by saying, yes, we are, in, we are planted here. We are missing that small part. And so the chair will go on in a perpetuity because all they are spending from there, it's the interest on the 3 million. So we have to get that finished. And we started since 2007 when we were doing the negotiations. Um, we talked about the urban environment where mm -hmm. we were looking at police community, the collection of data, uh, the, the segregated. Uh, we talked about what's happening in the educational system. We talked about a whole series of mental health, all of those things we talked about. And we call them urban issues. And uh, so the chair at the time, that was the thinking that we were talking about the new urban environment. And um, the first chair operated on the, with that title. And uh, the second chair is now Dr. Carl James. And um, in the discussion, it was felt that if we talked about community, education, diaspora, that it will be more understandable to, um, to our folks. And so that's okay. where we are, Jean Augustine Chair in Education, uh, Community, Education, Diaspora. And it is the hope that in this level of consciousness, this urgency of now, the, uh, the young people having been awakened to uh, the importance of uh, these things in, uh, in corporate, academic, and institutional bodies, that we can all come up and put our, our pennies together and make sure that we reach that 1.2 and that we fully fund that chair, which is like the basement secure. And then the rest can happen because we can do the programming and everything else, which is really the work of the chairholder. That's so awesome. And I know we're running out of time, but just in closing, you've accomplished so much. And yes, Kim and I, we are catching the baton and moving forward. But what keeps you motivated to continue to do what you do? Just in short, as we're closing. Uh, Ron, I have a, I had, I've had a blessed life. I think that, uh, that I grew up in Happy Hill, St. George's Grenada. I grew up with a lot of relatives around me who didn't have any of the blessings that I have. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I feel, and from day one, I think that God has directed my life in various directions. He's led me down several paths. Whenever I come to the crossroad, I look to him and he says, this is the way to go. Mm -hmm. And so the word service um, has been built into my system and I've been provided with the blessings in order for me to fulfill the service. I don't do a lot of prayer, I'm sure, like you guys do. My prayer is always, thy will be done. Yes. Thy yes. will be done. That's it. That's it. That's it. All right. All so right. if you want to find out more about how you can uh, be a part of this uh, change and get it fully in doubt, of course, you could visit www.jeanaugustine.ca. Um, we are running out of time. Uh, but I, I just want to talk very quickly because even amidst all this, you know, accreditation and everything that you've had, you just remain so humble, so personable. The last time I saw you in person, it was at my um, RBC Top 40 Award, which, of course, you, you know, won years ago, paving the way again um, for us. But just what keeps you like that, just to remain humble amidst all of this and all the things that you have um, under your belt in closing? Well, I'm not too sure that I walk around each day saying I must be humble, I must be humble. This is the way I'm built. <laughs> I know okay. who I am, I know my roots, I know what it is and, and I've grounded myself in community. And my joy is really talking to you today. My joy is being with young people, seeing their progress. My joy is looking at those who walk across um, the, the line with their university or their academic certificates. My joy is in empowering young people to be the leaders of tomorrow. And so I draw my energy from that. 
and um, and I grew up with an old saying: "Pride goes before a fall." Uh, you know, this this whole business. You you um, you just stay grounded, stay who you are, and yes. um, and that's that's who I am. Nothing. Uh, and I, I know and that if time. I were in Grenada at the time, you, you they talk about you know you have a soul and head, you know? right? <laughs> so you don't get a soul and head. You know who you are, and um, there is no need for me to to shout. You know I have you know so many doctorates and I have so many this and I have so many. There is no need to do that. Amazing. I think that. Um, that I just groomed myself. The work speaks for itself. Work You're up for itself. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. yes, 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 yes. All right, awesome. Thank you so very much. We, we are just about running out of time. It was an absolute honor to have you today. <laughs> Uh, we look forward to having you another time. I mean, I know there's a litany of things under your belt and so much that we could have covered, but we are so appreciative of your time and thank you so much for joining us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And God we'll bless. be right yes. back after this break. God bless. This is On The Move. Welcome to our inspirational corner. As we come to the end of our first season, we pray that you have been inspired, that you have been motivated, and that you have been touched with these inspirations that we've been sending your way. You know that it's very important for us to keep in mind that as we continue to move through life and through the different seasons in life that each and every one of us have been gifted and has been given the ability to be a change agent. And I'm just encouraging you that whatever field that you may be in, whether, whether it's political or whether if it's in entertainment or education, whatever field that you are in, I want you to continue to be a trailblazer. Continue to make your mark so that at the end of the day, when you leave this earth, your fingerprint would be placed in that area that God has placed you. I want you to boldly to go forth and to do all that is in your heart to do according to the will of God. And know that you have been created, you have been designed as a unique individual. There's absolutely nobody else in this world that is like you and can accomplish what you have been designed to accomplish. So until we see you in the next season, I want you to be encouraged, be inspired, and continue to be on the move. Because remember, movement is the rhythm of life. Thank you so much for watching. This has been On The Move, where as always, we keep you informed and inspired. We are officially at episode 13, which means it's the end of season one. What an adventure it has been for Andrea and I. Uh, we want to say very special thank you once again to our guests. We can think of a better way to close out uh, season one. Thank you so much for all the views, the likes, the shares, the comments, and for those who've supported us thus far. And of course, for further opportunity about how you can support us for sponsorships and for commercial slots, you can email us at onthemove at gftv. Dot life. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and uh, hit the notification button so that you can be the first to know when On The Move is live. Uh, go ahead and check out all our uh, shows thus far. Uh, we've gone through a, a litany of uh, different apps and it's been amazing. Until next time, take care.